What if we could manufacture leather without killing the cow? What if Alzheimer's were actually an issue of bacteria and we could cure it? And what if we could grow our own replacement bone? Well, I'm Julia Moore and this is the science that we're funding at Breakout Labs. At Breakout Labs, we're investing in the future. We're investing in radical, category-creating science, and we think we found a pretty good model to do it. So today I'll tell you a little bit about the problem that we saw in the market, the experiment that we ran because of it that became Breakout Labs, and why we think it's working. So first of all, to tell you the story, I'll bring you back uh, to the last economic downturn. Peter Thiel. He's an entrepreneur, an investor. He's also my boss. Um, he was frustrated with the lack of innovation that the market was producing. We were asking ourselves, where were those innovation dollars going? Well, we really felt like those innovation dollars weren't really moving us forward. There was plenty of investment dollars for um, R&D and innovation in sort of web tech or incremental technological advances, and even less available for radical scientific-based companies. Um, so if companies were the agents of change, why weren't they changing anything meaningful? Well, it was because the model was harder for radical science or science-based companies at all. Um, there was funding available for uh, projects that were in academic labs, and there was funding available for companies that were further along that have kind of de-risked their stories with partners or investors. But what funding was available for those early stage um, proof of concept studies that helped de-risk these stories? Well, the answer is that there really wasn't enough. So we designed our own experiment. What if we use philanthropic dollars to invest in companies? What if we uh, use low risk capital to take on the risk that the market wouldn't? And what if we supported these companies as much as possible uh, to help them get to the other side of that funding gap. Well, that's exactly how we design Breakout Labs, to do just that. At Breakout Labs, we are a seed stage philanthropic fund in Peter Thiel's foundation. We invest $350,000 against very specific milestones into radical early stage companies. Um, we invest across the advanced sciences, but we have a focus on the intersection of technology and biology. Uh, we also uh, write these checks as grants, but if the company is successful, that grant converts into equity. We also support these companies as much as we can, helping them get the most out of every dollar and every day that they're in those early stages. So what type of companies do we uh, fund at Breakout Labs? Well, it's a really specific type of company, and first it's that idea of a radical science company, um, as I kind of mentioned, and we really ask the question during diligence, if it works, does it matter? And we use a network of academic scientists to do our scientific diligence at scale. We also only fund companies. That's really important because there are a lot of research projects out there. We really believe that companies are the agents of change and that's how we're going to get these radical scientific advances out of the lab and into the economy. We also only fund full-time founders. We believe that these entrepreneurs need to be betting their career on this company. We're betting on them. Um, so we think that's the only way it works. And lastly, we fund this sort of idea of catalytic data sets, but again, that proof of concept study. Some data that actually tells the story to the market um, that this is less risky and so that uh, funders and partners can follow us on. And what does it mean to support these companies? Well, we like to join your team. We take a board observer seat and we get our companies that are pretty early stage to adopt board meetings and reporting probably earlier than they would otherwise. Uh, we practice tough love. We uh, often tell our companies what they really don't want to hear, but they need to, uh, often over a beer or a glass of wine. And we leverage our network. We get them access to the right investors, the right partners, the right resource providers, and even the right media at the right times. So now, almost four years later, um, we're just going into our fourth year now, uh, is our experiment working? Well, the early data suggests that it is. Are we any closer? to manufacturing leather without killing the cow? Well, yes, we are. In 2012, we funded Modern Meadow and Andrus Forecast. In 2014, they raised a Series A. And just last year, they moved into a 20,000 square foot pilot production facility in Brooklyn's Biobat, and they secured a 15-year veteran out of DuPont as their CTO. They're currently raising their Series B in preparation for their commercial launch. Are we closer to a cure for Alzheimer's? Yes, 
We are. In 2014, we funded Cortexime and Casey Lynch at a time when no one in the pharma world would engage them um, due to their controversial theory on the root cause of Alzheimer's. But not even a couple years later, with some data that we funded, they were able to raise a Series A with two of those large pharmas that closed in January. Are we closer to growing our own replacement bone? Yes. We are. In 2014, we funded EpiBone and Nina Tandon, specifically to prove that they could grow anatomically precise replacement cheekbones in 12 pigs. So now the pig study is coming to a close. The data looks great. Those pigs look fabulous with their new cheekbones, and they now have a data set that they can go out and raise their Series A funding with. And what does the rest of our portfolio look like? Because those aren't our only successes. So far, we've invested in 26 radical science companies. 26 companies where we can confidently answer yes to the question, if it works, does it matter? Of those 26 companies, seven have raised a Series A, two are currently raising a Series B, and we've had one exit. Overall, we've attracted $65 million of follow-on funding for our $9 million of investment so far just in a few years. And our companies are also thriving. They are reaching their scientific milestones at a breakneck pace. They are attracting even more grant funding for their work. And they're landing partnerships with leading corporates in their space. So what did we learn from this experiment? Um, what worked and what didn't? So here are some of the takeaways from those first few years, or these first few years so far. Some of the things that worked. First of all, capturing momentum. Uh, a lot of companies in our space in the early stage scientists or in sciences are surviving on grant dollars for as long as they can. We actually like to be within kind of that first year after they've spun out of the lab or they've launched. We like an entrepreneur to be hungry and to be ready to run with that momentum. Prioritizing de-risking signals. Again, it's that idea of looking at that proof of concept study and how does that de-risk your story. Um, you know, you really can't attract the funders and the partners that follow us without it. Uh, backing coachable founders. So it's an incredibly difficult lab, um, journey from the lab into a company. You have to back founders that are ready for that journey and they're willing to learn. We like to think that tough love works, but really it only works with the right entrepreneur. And lastly, focusing on a small market first. We have a lot of pitches that kind of come in and say, if we only own 2% of this huge market, um, but we actually like to think that if you're a really radical scientific advance, that you can own a small market first, or you can even create a new market. Use that as your proof market and then go to the larger market later. There's some other things that really didn't work that well, and so we pivoted pretty quickly. Um, first of all, the idea of the part-time scientist, scientist entrepreneur. Um, you can't have one foot in the lab, uh, in a university lab, right, and one foot in a company. The company almost never wins. Uh, and just writing a check. So we really thought that this was an issue of funding um, primarily when we started. And so we thought our, our check would do a lot of the work. But really, there's so much more support needed. It's a tough and lonely road as an entrepreneur, and specifically as a scientist entrepreneur. You need as much support from us and from each other to really make it through that funding gap. And lastly, waiting to figure out who that customer is. I think a lot of our, uh, especially, especially scientists, entrepreneurs, are so focused on scaling that science outside of the lab that they think about the customer as someone that they can engage down the line. Well, our best entrepreneurs are really engaging uh, that customer with their hypothesis early and often, and often finding out that that customer or their final customer won't be who they thought it was. So where are we now? Well, like our companies, we're in growth mode, and so we're always iterating. But we'd like to think that we can make a bet that our experiment is working. So today I told you a little bit about uh, the problem that we saw in the market at Breakout Labs, uh, the experiment that we ran because of it, which became Breakout Labs in our fund, and why we think it's working. So I hope you can leave here realizing that philanthropic capital actually does have a role in early stage companies and successful early stage companies. And I challenge you to ask the question of our model, if it works, does it matter? And I'd argue that we have a new generation of radical science venture backed companies that proves that it does. Thanks, and I'll take any questions probably during the break. Give you guys a break. Yeah, I'll just I'll just meet you during the break. Okay, thanks.